Well, I was hoping to start for for nine. I, I think that's the time that we. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, that's good. All right. Yeah, all right. That's fine. All right. All right. How's it going, YouTube? I am uh, very excited and honored today to be speaking with a uh, well-known um, and notable New Testament professor, Dr. Gary Burge, um, professor or academic dean at Calvin mm -hmm. Theological Seminary. And we're going to be talking about his new book, uh, The New Testament in Seven Sentences, which Baker mm -hmm. has, uh, uh, which IVP has graciously sent me a free copy of. But before we get into that, I just want to let you guys know that we have selected our two um, book winners uh, for our book giveaway that we did uh, for The Contradictory Christ from J.C. Beale and for uh, The Letter in the Spirit of Biblical Interpretation by Dr. Stanglin. So we'll be announcing that hopefully tomorrow and letting you guys know who's getting that book. With that said, if you have not subscribed to the channel, I want to encourage you to subscribe to the channel. Uh, we are grateful for all of the people that have been following and who are supporting um, this uh, ministry uh, You know that me and my family are doing. And so we just want to encourage that you guys continue to share the content if you find it useful. Uh, so with that said, uh, Dr. Burge, why don't you just begin by um, saying a little bit about your academic kind of background and interests and yeah. uh, what led up to this book? Great, Nicholas, good to be with you there. And uh, it's uh, always a delight to talk about something like this with folks who have a serious interest in theology. Um, <clears throat> my own academic background is, uh, well, originally I'm from Southern California. So it's not quite uh, South Florida, but it certainly is uh, similar. We think it's better than South Florida, by the way. There's just sort of this thing <laughs> about that. <clears throat> we don't know what humidity is in uh, Southern California. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, but so I went to the University of California, uh, Riverside campus there. And, uh, and then I went to Fuller Seminary, which was a really great experience. But it's in Pasadena, California. So for me, it was like an hour from where I lived. So um, that was great. And then after I finished uh, at Fuller, um, then I decided to do a PhD in New Testament studies. And uh, I uh, went to Scotland. So being in Europe for three years was a great experience. And I worked with a really well-known New Testament scholar who passed away actually about three years ago, um, I. Howard Marshall. Yeah. So Marshall has, uh, yeah, kind of lives in the legacy of, oh, I don't know, F.F. F. Bruce, uh, in that there's a whole British, um, you could say, evangelical sort of, um, uh, yeah, runs through a lot of the major universities. And uh, so F.F. F. Bruce is one of those, and Howard Marshall is one. And you could think of James Dunn as living in that, N.T. Wright is living in that legacy. Um, anyway, it it's, has a very English or British tone to it, and uh, different than what you'd find in America, I guess. So anyway, yeah, so that's my uh, academic background, and I've been working in Christian higher education now for um, a really long time. Uh, today, <clears throat> um, well, the bulk of my career was at Wheaton College in Chicago, where I was a professor of New Testament, and we had a large grad school as well as an undergrad program. So anyway, I worked in both of those. Uh, today, I met uh, in West Michigan, and uh, I've only been here three years. I'm the uh, no, goodness, this is my fifth year. <laughs> um, so it's, I'm the dean of the seminary. Um, I uh, also professor of New Testament and, uh, and uh, Calvin Sem is uh, just a wonderful place. Uh, West Michigan is a wonderful place. It's beautiful here along Lake Michigan. And, um, but it, <clears throat> it is deeply committed to the reform tradition and um, has a very European heritage to it. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it doesn't have a kind of the American evangelicalism has tended to be rooted in fundamentalism and the prohibition and a lot of those kind of things like markers in American evangelicalism will tend to be political views and uh, really, and feelings about alcohol and feelings about dancing. You know, you get a lot of those kinds of things over the last 30 or 40 years. The European evangelical tradition just doesn't have any of that. Mm -hmm. So it's been really fascinating for me to be there. Um, and uh, I, I really respect what we're doing at Calvin. And uh, uh, maybe some of your listeners will enroll someday. Yeah, yeah. And that's awesome. So you had the privilege of studying at, at Aberdeen, correct? Under uh, that's right. Dr. I. Howard Marshall, um, taught yeah. New Testament for uh, uh, many years. And now you're a dean at uh, Calvin. So what led up specifically to writing the New Testament Seven Sentences? Right. So this book, I've got one here in my hand. Uh, this is it here. Um, <clears throat> this is a part of a series. And it began with a book on uh, philosophy originally. And uh, it was Philosophy in Seven Sentences by Douglas Grutois. 
And uh, <clears throat> we now have three. And I think the series is complete. One is on the Old Testament, one is on the New, and one is on philosophy. So anyway, here's the fundamental idea. Um, uh, I do the New Testament volume. Chris Wright, uh, a British scholar, does the Old Testament volume. And it is this, that so often in church, what we hear in sermons um, can really seem to be relatively thin. It's, it, it moves toward application rapidly. But if you ask the average Christian, um, it's hard for them to explain what the fundamental ideas are inside of, say, the Old and New Testament. So InterVarsity came to us and said, look, here's the challenge. If you were to distill the entire New Testament down to about seven basic ideas, what do you think the seven foundational <laughs> ideas are in the New Testament? This is what we came up with. So, you know, in a way, the title is a little bit of a misnomer. It's not the New Testament with seven sentences. It is, if you could summarize the New Testament as seven fundamental ideas, what would you do with that? Gotcha. And I just had fun. I just started with a blank sheet of paper. And I said, well, considering I've been teaching for all of these years, if I were not to look at my notes and simply were to write down what I think are the seven things I hope every seminarian takes home with them from school, these would be the seven. Mm -hmm. Don't miss them. If you miss these, you have missed one of the pillars of your education. Mm -hmm. And it'll inform all the rest of your preaching, teaching, and your living, for heaven's sakes. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, take the idea of Messiah. Um, people think that's where you start with the New Testament. And you ask the average person, well, what does Messiah mean? Nah, usually they don't really know. Yeah, They don't know. So, therefore, what I'm doing is developing the idea of Messiah, for instance, in one chapter, and moving it from there. Yeah, yeah. So InterVarsity has this uh, series, you know, you got philosophy, Old Testament, and now New Testament. And I, man, I would love to have uh, <laughs> Dr. Wright on to speak about the Old Testament one. But um, so so you have these fundamental ideas that you want to put together. You right. want to tell us a little bit more about some of the criteria that went into like I, I, what, I what I was thinking is I wonder what almost made the cut, but just <laughs> just didn't get it. You know, <laughs> yeah, I can't give that away. Yeah, it's hard, it's interesting. You Well, you know, a lot of it is, it is subjective, Nicholas. It really is. I mean, you, but then again, on the other hand, it isn't. It's like writing a New Testament theology. Um, look at the table of contents in a good New Testament theology. Well, how did that author decide to organize these ideas in the following manner? It's the very same thing. You've taught this, you shouldn't write one of these books unless you've been teaching probably for at least 25 years. <laughs> because what happens is, your understanding of the big categories matures and it distills. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't difficult for me to come up with what I think are, are, are seven huge ideas. Like number three is the cross. That's an enormous idea. Four is, the, is grace, the idea of covenant of spirit. These, these were not, it wasn't difficult actually to find those seven ideas because I think as I think, as I reflect back on the many classes I've taught in New Testament theology, um, these are the seven pillars. Yeah. And uh, so reflection on your experience and imagination kind of tells you really what you need to know. It's like going to a, a dietitian or something mm -hmm. yeah. that has been in the business for 25 years. And Nicholas, you ask, well, what should I avoid eating? Mm -hmm. They're not going to pause very long before they say, stay away from fast food. <laughs> they just know this. It's yeah. just that simple. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that's that's how it came about. Good. I don't think anything missed the cut necessarily. Okay. It, when I when I worked on this for a, probably a week, the outline, I, I thought, no, this is it. This is it. Yeah, I felt, felt good about it. That, that's good to know. That's very comforting, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so I want to ask you, uh, who are the kind of people that you think an introduction like this would be good for? This introduction um, originally was written for a lay audience, for average people. <clears throat> and that is InterVarsity's, one of their most important audiences. However, let me put it this way. InterVarsity, though, um, is not like Ravel or something like this. InterVarsity... Um, goes for the student. That's who they write well. So I would call this the mature Christian. 
um, who is reading thoughtfully um, and is uh, wanting to supplement their lives with not just narratives about other Christians' experiences or fiction or anything. They want to uh, go deeper. They want to go to the next level in their own thought. Yeah. So um, it would be a, a university or college student, uh, actually a, a mature person in church would benefit from this. Um, I think seminarians, if this was a New Testament introduction, yeah. if, if you came out of seminary and you could actually articulate these seven ideas, yeah. you'd be so ahead of things. Yeah. Um, originally, the idea for this, I, I taught for a long time. I lived in Chicago for 25 years, and I, I taught monthly at a very large gathering at a big church called Willow Creek Community Church in Chicago. <laughs> Most people have heard of it. Um, and um, on Wednesday nights, we had about 1,200 people come. Imagine that, a Wednesday night service with 1,200. Yeah. Um, I like doing that service a lot. Um, the weekends when you had eight or 9,000 in the audience, it just didn't feel the same. Mm -hmm. So anyway, what we did is we decided we want to create a curriculum. And that was the original idea of this book. And that's why it's dedicated to that midweek community at Willow Creek. Mm -hmm. um, so we said, look, couldn't we just march through each of these one Wednesday night per topic and have everyone in that midweek thing buy one of these and they read the chapter during the week? Yeah. That just was an amazingly cool idea. And, and that 1,200 people, we called them the core of Willow. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that just ate this kind of thing up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I could definitely see that, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to help people get these handlebars um, mm -hmm. just through Sunday mornings. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, I've been in, in student ministry for a year and a half now, going on to two years in August. Right. And um, one of the things that I've made a mistake on already, <laughs> you know, is at the yeah. beginning, I was kind of like, you know, we have all these resources. Uh, uh, we're not going to really um, kind of make a big point to have uh, a Bible in your hand. You know, the kids have right. phones, things like that. But one of the things I changed my mind about recently is it really doesn't help you get the big picture when you have such a fragmented device, you know, that's devoted to so many yeah. things being the that's thing right. you're getting your Bible reading of. You need something that really gives you that big picture. And having a physical copy of the Bible is one way that really helps you to literally have a grasp of the whole story, you know, in your hand. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I think Actually, that this is like great for that. I'm, I'm willing, I'm, I'm, I'm with you entire, entirely on that. And this thing is not generational, by the way. Mm -hmm. This thing is just a, this is a, a, a feature of a high tech age. And, and I think already we're beginning to abandon some of this. I mean, look at this, for instance, um, if you like to read novels, um, a lot of people like to read them on a screen, mm -hmm. but do you know that print copies of novels and books basically are going up right now? Mm -hmm. What's going on with that? Because we are embodied creatures who are the physicality of our life is important to us. And so therefore, when you actually own a text of the Bible and you actually are moving through it with your hands, mm -hmm. you are um, assimilating a lot more than you realize. Yeah. And so therefore that goes with you. It's very ephemeral. It's very vanishing. It's very Gnostic, I'd say, to read the Bible on your phone because it's really, it's just a lot of electronics there. Yeah. And it doesn't have the same physical presence inside of your life. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, if you can do that with your students, oh, good, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we'll be able to do it. <laughs> uh, so, so let's start off by working through some of these criteria. Um, and I pulled these questions. So the book comes equipped with the discussion guide at the end of the yep. book that helps you to walk through each chapter um, and some yep. of the key ideas presented in. So these are just questions from that discussion guide. So the first theme is uh, Messiah. So what was the basic idea of the Messiah in Jesus's day? And how did Jesus fulfill uh, that idea? Right. Yeah. So Nicholas, this is, yeah, you can't just start out with talking about the gospels using the word Messiah. Um, you have to start back a bit and talk about, well, how what is God's relationship to history? And, and, and this is where it becomes really valuable and practical to us. In other words, um, throughout the Old Testament, you have this notion that God will use critical catalytic people who will step into history on God's behalf and actually lead Israel to a place of safety and salvation. It's very simple. 
Okay. So therefore you have that person who is anointed, you might say, who is empowered by God, called by God, directed by God to do something um, saving. It's really as simple as that. It could be political salvation. It could be spiritual salvation. It was really more political, historical salvation. Moses is your template. Mm -hmm. That's where you want to go when you think about this character. But it can even be some secular person like Cyrus, the Persian king. He, he can be a, a, a sort of a saving character figure like that as well. Okay, so Israel understands history in the sense that God does not simply make history and leave it on its own, but God actually lives with his people through history. And in times of crisis, he actually anoints those who will step into that history and bring about a resolution. Okay, now what happens is that the crises in Israel's history were compounding on themselves from roughly... Um, 500 BC forward. I mean, it is a very difficult period. In fact, uh, from the time from the fourth century, from the time of the arrival of the Greeks, uh, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, you can see that history is just a catastrophic time for Israel. Um, Israel has lost its own sense of nationhood even um, because other, they're, they're conquered, they're occupied. So what happens from 300 years before Jesus ever comes there is formed in the later prophets an idealized notion that somehow God, as he has stepped into history in the past, is going to also step into history again. But this is going to be a, a, a really climactic intervention. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. And there's this anticipation for this. So to understand all of that, you really have to get outside of the Old Testament. You have to look at, at Jewish writing between the Old and the New Testament to get this idea. So when, when, when Jesus steps onto the stage and he begins using the language of Messiah, Messiah in Hebrew, Messiah simply means anointing. Um, and so Christos, Krio in Greek simply means to anoint something. It could be putting paint on a fence or oil on your head. Christos means somebody who is anointed, okay? Mm -hmm. It's a noun form from the verb krio. So therefore, when Jesus begins to talk about himself as the one who is anointed, meaning the one who is here to act in God's behalf to bring hope to his people, immediately his audiences are going to think to themselves, this is going to be a political solution to our problems. Mm. Gotcha. So this is why Jesus again and again says to his audiences, do not go around telling everybody that I just used the word Messiah. Keep this stuff quiet yeah. because this is subject to such mm. misunderstanding. With Moses, remember, he frees Israel from the Egyptians, defeats Pharaoh. That's a very political thing. So is it possible that the Messiah is going to defeat the Romans, for instance? And that language of political messiahship is everywhere in Jesus' day. Mm -hmm. right, that's the first big idea. So Jesus has to step onto the stage and say, I am God's anointed to work on God's behalf, yes, in this time. But at the same time, what he has to do is he has to redefine messiahship. Mm -hmm. And that's what most people don't realize. So therefore, he takes on a role that they frankly are not ready for. They don't like this. They want the political role. But instead he's saying a different kind of solution is needed today, a different therapy for the problem. Okay, the last thing let me say is this. There is no notion in Israel's history of a divine Messiah. There isn't. Mm -hmm. There's no notion of this. So therefore when Jesus steps onto the stage and he begins using language, not only of God's agent in the world, but he begins to associate himself with the Father so intimately, so closely. This also makes people unsettled. Mm -hmm. So Jesus, in many ways, is stepping onto Israel's um, stage. He is using an ancient category from the Old Testament. But just like new wine in old wine skins, it will break the wine skin. Mm -hmm. So he is sort of evolving the notion of Messiah. Going wrong in Israel's story. So they're waiting for like this grand 
reintroduction of God's saving yeah. act and saving uh, actor. Right. Gotcha. They're asking, are we going to see Elijah? Are we going to see a prophet? What are we going to see? Yeah. Will God step into history again? Yeah. From the exile forward, will God act? Mm -hmm. When will God act? That's the question they're asking. And then Jesus comes in, he's like, well, this, there is a problem. It does need a solution, but it's not the solution you're expecting. And I'm not right. the kind of actor that you're expecting. So he's going to expand right. both kind of categories. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, because political revolt against Rome was everywhere. It was a highly political period in the first century. So uh, for, let me give you one example, Nicholas. When somebody comes up to Jesus and says, "Here's a, do we pay taxes to Caesar or do we not pay taxes to Caesar? <laughs> That is not a question about the IRS. <laughs> that is not a question about, it is a veiled question because in this highly politically charged environment, you, you, you hide what you want to say. It's just like politics today. Mm -hmm. People, when, when we're in a really charged environment, you know, you use innuendo, you use metaphor. It so happened that there was a whole revolt against Rome based on refusal to pay taxes. The reason the Romans occupied provinces like Judea was because they wanted money. That's all they want to build their empire. That's all it. So anyway, there was a whole movement saying, we are going to resist Rome. Um, they were called the Zealots, and they said, we'll use violence if we have to, but we don't pay our taxes. We burn tax archives. They did. They burned the archives of registered property all over the country. That was their thing. And if there's no registration anywhere of property, then you don't have to, you don't know who to charge for taxes. It's really brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> so when Jesus then hears this question, the question isn't, do we pay taxes? The real question of Jesus is, sir, are you willing to support the rebellion? Mm -hmm. And when Jesus picks up a coin and says, whose image is this? <laughs> they say Caesar's. And he says, well, give Caesar what Caesar wants. Jesus' actual answer is, gentlemen, I appreciate your interest in my ministry, but I have no interest in your political rebellion. But thank you very much. Go pay your taxes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so in a way, when Jesus is, 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 is the, there's more and more clarity about his identity as the Messiah, people are wanting to fit Jesus into their agenda for politics. Yeah. Now, Nicholas, right now, uh, the year is, it is springtime 2021. Yeah. <laughs> and we, for the last two years anyway, at least since 2016, have lived in the most politically charged time in my own personal memory, and probably yours too. <laughs> I mean, politics are just jumping off the walls, okay? And what is happening is that evangelicals, Christians in our culture, many won't want to hear this, have wanted to say that their political agenda is the Christian agenda. Yeah. Do you follow me? Of course. Mm -hmm. It's the very same thing, Nicholas. It is to say, Jesus, are you willing to support this political agenda? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and of course, Jesus says, thank you very much, but I think my kingdom is of a different sort. Gotcha. So, so Jesus doesn't just uh, expand or redefine their understanding of messiahship. He also does the same thing to their understanding of God's kingdom. And we've kind of already discussed oh, a lot yeah. of this. Uh, so I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. But the, the second sentence regards uh, relates to God's kingdom. How did Jesus utterly upend the Jewish expectations of God's kingdom? It's it's just flows right from what we were talking about a moment ago. So uh, when Jesus comes into Jerusalem on the triumphal entry and people are saying, blessed, you know, is the son of David, you know, who's going to bring about the kingdom of David. All this language about David and kingdom. And by the way, the waving of palms, you know, this these are all political national symbols for Israel. Palms, cross palms around all the coins of, of, of Judea in this time. So um, when you talk about a kingdom, it's a very dangerous concept. It's a concept that says, okay, it's just going to be the restoration of the glorious kingdom that David built for us a thousand years ago. Is that yeah. what we're going to have? Is it, is it going to, to 
you know, make Israel great again. That's what I was going to say. So make yeah, Israel yeah. Great I knew again. you were thinking about this. Yeah. But that's a common idea. It's not something that just comes from modern politics. Mm -hmm. That idea that you, you imagine a greater past, and usually it's a fantasy, and you say to yourself that we are going to empower the present political agenda by that fantasy from the past. So, yeah, so when people, so Jesus has to say, yes, I am establishing a kingdom, yeah. but the kingdom of God, the kingdom over which I reign is going to be different than any kingdom you've ever seen. Mm -hmm. It is a kingdom not of one ethnicity and race. It's not a kingdom of one geography. It is going to be a kingdom in which there are values promoted that no one nationalism would ever want to contain. Mm -hmm. So what Jesus is actually doing with his talk of the kingdom is he is separating nationalism, you might say, from deeper spiritual values. Mm -hmm. Now, these spiritual values are all about still transforming the world. It yeah. isn't about just going to heaven. And so, Nicholas, I can do the very same thing that I did five minutes ago. I can say, oh, my gosh, really? So the kingdom of God then is, is, is a commitment I make. It's a movement that I'm participating in that cannot be defined by any political moment, Yeah. even in America. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they're looking forward to God's kingdom. Whereas, I mean, I guess you can compare it to what many modern Christians may have kind of have this just completely spiritual approach to the hope for God's kingdom. You know, it has nothing right. to do with the physical world. For them, it has everything to do with the national, you know, oh, yeah. uh, geographical and political, you know, uh, situation of Israel. And Jesus comes in and he's saying, you know, it's going to be more than that. It's going to be multi-ethnic. It's going to be crossing yeah. um, geographical <laughs> borders and valuable for this world and for the next. It's a vision for a new way to think about life. It's a vision for a new ordering of human existence. It is, in other words, it is a it is a gathering up of men and women for whom the Sermon on the Mount is their marching orders. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is going to be this is going to be a realm which moves across international lines. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a completely different way to think about the world. So this is what Paul is talking about in Ephesians chapter two. The dividing wall is broken mm -hmm. down between yeah. ethnicities. Doesn't mean you have to give up being whatever ethnicity you have. I'm mostly Swedish. I'm not going to give that one up. Um, <laughs> um, but but still, it, it, you 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 realize that a new citizenship, a new identity, has settled over you, and you are going to begin to embody values that are different than the rest of the world. Yeah. So is it about this world? Oh, Judaism could not think about salvation without thinking about this world. Yeah. It, yeah, it's to transform this world. But that transformation is then preparation for that eternal life that God is offering to us as well. Good, good. So let's get on to the next point. And this has to do with the crucifixion. Um, and this actually come, this came up in one of our studies uh, not too long ago as we were speaking about the crucifixion. Uh, it just seems like the disciples can't get what Jesus is trying to clearly tell them <laughs> that he is going to right. uh, have to cruci mm -hmm. be crucified and die. So why were Jesus's audiences ill prepared to recognize right. the necessity of his uh, death? Well, on the one hand, you have a very old. This is notice how I'm always going back into the Old Testament yeah. and pulling threads forward, and that's one of the things I think this book tries to bring through. The New Testament cannot live on its own. Sure. The New Testament is chapter two of a two chapter book. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you almost want to read Chris Wright's uh, seven sentence book and then do this one. Yeah. And then you've got the whole package. Okay. okay. So there is a thread and I'll develop that thread in a moment, but also this idea of Jesus announcing his own identity as Messiah, there is no precedent let me make this really clear, inside of Hebrew scriptures or inside of Judaism of the period um, for a dying Messiah. The Messiah doesn't sort of get, become martyred. Are you kidding me? Like Moses, he's victorious. Mm -hmm. He's strong. He's, he, he, he does not, death and sacrifice are not a part of his agenda. And by the way, there is nothing about resurrection in any of Judaism like this. There is an eschatological resurrection at the end of time, but 
that he would die and rise and he says all this at once, he'll be handed over to the Gentiles and they're going to have his way with him? Are you kidding me? So there is nothing attaching death and Messiah. These two ideas don't go together, mm -hmm. okay? All right, hold that, put it on the shelf for okay. a moment. Now reach back into the Old Testament and pick up another thread. And that is this idea that um, is suffering a vehicle through which wholeness is achieved? That's a really huge idea. Is suffering, a is sacrifice a vehicle through which suffering is achieved? Hmm, wow. Now I can go to Abraham and Isaac. That's a remarkable story. How oh, is it okay. that there might be sacrifice as a part of a fulfillment of Abraham's promises? How can that be? How can sacrifice, the word salvation, <clears throat> Greek sozo, is, is, sozain, is um, means to take something which is broken and putting it back together again. If you drop a clay pot and you put it, glue it back together again, now it is saved. It is made whole. That's what sozain means. Okay. So therefore, as Israel moves through history, does God have to do things which are painful in order to bring about Israel's salvation. That's, the, that's, that's, a, that's a remarkable idea. So therefore, look at this. When Abraham makes the, his covenant with God, you know probably that in Genesis 12 through 15, when you have this covenant made with Yahweh, um, it is a special kind of treaty in which um, there is sacrifice, and then God moves between the parts of the sacrifice. And in that, God is binding himself to, to the consequences of failing to come through on his covenant. So God's faithfulness can break God's heart even. God's faithfulness is so consistent, he's willing to suffer to bring his people into, into what they need to be. Now, this is encapsulated. The most important place to find this is in Isaiah. Yeah. Isaiah recognizes that Israel's ambition is to think that if they create a political kingdom again, they will find happiness and salvation. Mm -hmm. America believes this. <laughs> but Isaiah says, instead, a different kind of medicine is needed. God is going to send to you a suffering servant, somebody who is going to not be someone who is um, sort of attractive, someone who's doing all the things that you want for your political agenda in your yeah. life, but he is going to take on the sacrificial burden of Israel. Mm -hmm. Just like animals went to the altar, this, this, this one character who's going to step, this son of man, this person who's going to step into history, he's going to take on all of this. Isaiah calls him the suffering servant. Mm -hmm. So how is it this salvation is going to come about through an agent who comes from God who suffers among us? Mm -hmm. Now, inside of Judaism, the century before Jesus, you have these two images of the strong political Messiah and this Isaiah suffering servant. Now, here's what Jesus does. He weds the two. Mm -hmm. And he says that the only way that Israel is going to be saved, the only way that we are going to bring about the redemption you dream of is if you recognize that God's affection for you is so great, he's willing to die on your behalf. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is actually saying, I am, yes, Messiah, but I am, yes, the suffering servant of Isaiah. Mm -hmm. And no one in Judaism had placed those two together. So you can see with the apostles, they're thinking, if he's the Messiah, he doesn't die. But they aren't listening to Yahweh from Isaiah. Passover, oh my gosh, they're, they're not realizing that at the Passover meal, when he pours wine and breaks bread, he's actually identifying himself with the sacrificial lamb of Passover. So woven into the fabric of Jesus' life is this idea of self-giving love, self-sacrificing investment. 
And that's what you have throughout the Old Testament. God's love for Israel is such that he's willing to incur pain to bring Israel to where it needs to be. Gotcha. Okay, so <laughs> just try to recap. That was excellent. So, so no one has dying on the Messiah's agenda. So that's just not a, a thing no. that's part of the, the, the ticket, right? You don't get elected it's to be Messiah. It's a contradiction. Messiah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's like somebody who runs for a president of the United States, and he, and he says, and by the way, I'm going to quit after one year. <laughs> yeah, so that's not <laughs> supposed like, to be what? a part of no. it. Gotcha. No, it's four years, dude. It's yeah. just four years. Yeah. So uh, what we have is you got these threads that you're pulling from the Old Testament again. We see uh, we are, but what we see in the Old Testament is that suffering will bring about restoration or wholeness to God's people. So we see this in the story That's of right. Abraham. Exactly. We see this in the Passover meal. We see this in mm-hmm. Isaiah. And whereas they're looking for political you see restoration, it in the ex- Nicholas, you see it in the exile. In the exile. How is it that the exile, the pain of the exile? can be a redemptive pain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So God's people, God is letting his people be conquered by Assyria and Babylon, Babylon especially, carried off into exile and brought back. He's willing to subject his own community to that kind of pain because he wants Israel's heart mm-hmm. more than he wants Israel's politics. Yeah. And that's what they're waiting for. They're they're hoping to find the fullness and and the restoration in a political uh, situation. That's but right. Jesus is wedding yeah. both, so yeah. he's going to bring the suffering and the wholeness and the expectation for the kingdom together um, as a solution. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's yeah. let's go yeah. on to grace. Yeah, I think that was excellent. Um, I mean, yeah. again, we're looking at a big picture view, and I think that just does that for us. You know, it kind of gives us a big picture glimpse of what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. So, um, so what can the stories of Abraham and the Exodus teach us about grace? So we've already talked about Abraham and the Exodus a lot, which is excellent. Uh, so yeah, what can those stories also yeah. teach us about yeah. the New Testament theme of grace? So many people make the mistake inside of the church thinking that the New Testament is the book of grace and the Old Testament is the book of law. And it's really unfortunate. Because what's amazing to me, one little uh, fun fact, is that when Martin Luther discovered the grace of God again for himself, it was in the Psalms that he discovered most of these ideas. Uh, By the way, last time I looked, that's in the Old Testament. All right, so let's, let's ask ourselves. So what is God's fundamental relationship to his people? That's the question, really. And the word that is used throughout the Old Testament is chesed, or loving kindness, or steadfast love. Chesed is the Hebrew term, and it's repeated again and again throughout the Psalms, Mm -hmm. but it expresses something about the depth of someone's love and investment in someone else. In other words, there are different ways I can imagine, Nicholas, that someone, um, a wife or a girlfriend, might be interested in you. Um, on the one hand, they may say, well, he's such a handsome guy. He's so funny. He's so smart. He's so attractive. I'm drawn to him. But on the other hand, you might say, no, I can imagine a different kind of affection that is generated from within the heart of the lover, not drawn by the one loved, but instead generated from within the one who's loved. So in other words, it is affection which initiates love. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now go to Abraham for a minute. Abraham is basically a nomad. He is a nomad with his clan and he's moving across the Fertile Crescent between modern day Iraq and modern day Israel, Palestine. He's moving across the Fertile Crescent and God steps into his life when when Abraham has no merit, Mm -hmm. Abraham has no remarkable faith or anything. Abraham is met by God, and God says, Abraham, let's form a relationship. Children, land, these are the two things that you want. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, let's create a covenant relationship with each other in which my unilateral affection for you, I'm offering it to you. I simply ask that you live faithfully to our relationship. And so therefore in Genesis 15, it says, and Abraham believed God and it was 
given to him as righteousness. All he had to do was respond to the affection of God. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It wasn't as if God was looking at humanity and said, where's the most righteous, coolest guy that I can find? <laughs> yeah. Ah, there's that guy, Abraham. I find him really attractive. I think I'll use him. That's not the story. It is Abraham has an empty hand as he stands before God. And God says, I wish to fill those hands with good things, yeah. children and land. Gotcha. Okay. So I can see that the principle is the unilateral activity of God toward his people. Now, when I go to Moses and the Exodus, I learn that in the Old Testament, Israel has been living for over 400 years in Egypt. Their best trick, I guess, has been assimilating Egyptian religion. When they get out into the desert, they're quick about putting up an idol. <laughs> so they're, they're not, they have lost their grip, you might say, on, 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 on the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <laughs> 400 years. Think about that for yeah. a minute. I mean, go back in our time, 400 years. Have we changed in the last 400 years? Well, Israel did. God unilaterally steps into Israel's history overlooking their, I would call it their assimilated paganism, steps into their history, picks Moses and says, you are going to rescue my people. They are still his people, despite 400 years of this. So what happens is that God moves toward Israel when Israel is least attractive. He, you know, defeats Pharaoh with seven bullets he, he leads them through the sea, opens the sea, brings them into the wilderness. For three months, he carries them all the way. He feeds them. He gives them water, and he brings them to his mountain. Mm -hmm. And he says, now, look how cool that was. <laughs> In the last three months, I have defeated Egypt, and the Pharaoh considered himself a god. So I'm more powerful than Pharaoh. I've opened a magnificent sea. I fed you with, 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 with manna, with water, with quail. Now, look at everything I've done, and I've asked nothing of you. Now, in light of this, let's make a relationship. Okay. And the covenant is born at Mount Sinai. Okay. So here's the principle. God's salvation always precedes his expectation. Impressive. There's the principle. God's loving affection, his hasid, mm -hmm. precedes, comes before his expectation of the law. It's never the other way around in the Old Testament. Yeah. So the concept of grace embodies that. Mm -hmm. Grace means that God's love for us is grounded in who he is and not in your attractiveness. Mm -hmm. So when Paul is talking about the grace of God in the New Testament, he's not, he's not, contradicting the Old Testament, he's actually bringing to life mm -hmm. a theme that the Old Testament found central to its own identity. Gotcha. Uh, so yeah, so grace is an enormous idea throughout yeah. the entire Bible. It is. Yeah. Um, the Old Testament illustrates in narrative form um, exactly what the New Testament describes theologically. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, how much time do you have left? Because I, I want to make sure I get at least one more question from yeah. the guide. And uh, so yeah. are you pressed for time right now? No, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Oh, okay. So then I, I want to follow up on that grace. So so what we need to know about grace is, um, so we have this hesed of God, which is oriented within himself. So it's not something we do. Yeah. This faithful love comes from God because of who he is. Right. And It's and, not conditional. Yeah, yeah. And then be, as we see in the story of Abraham, his hesed, leads him to uh, call Abraham and bring Abraham into a covenant. That's right. Um, and with Moses, he calls Abraham or Moses out of Hesed. He does the Exodus out of Hesed. And then he brings them all yeah. the way to Mount Sinai out of Hesed and then brings them into a covenant. Mm -hmm. So God is acting in grace consistently in the Old Testament. And even, in other words, his intervention in history is an act of grace. Gotcha. So therefore, even in sending his son, Jesus Christ, into the world is an act of hesed. Mm -hmm. It's an act of grace. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so I wanted to ask you, um, I know there's a recent uh, uh, popular level book of Barclay's 
um, uh, the power of grace. I don't know if you've interacted with uh, uh, Barclay at all, but I was just wondering what your thoughts would be on his. He kind of has a distinction between grace is always unconditioned, but not unconditional. <laughs> yeah, right. So in other words, yeah, you're sort of torn between how do you illustrate this? Okay, so the problem you come into is this, there is an expectation is unconditional grace, meaning that the affection of God is given to Israel and yet Israel is expected to respond mm -hmm. faithfully, yeah. okay? So there is a reciprocity here. Mm -hmm. So God's grace is generously given, but then there is some expectation of covenant faithfulness. But what happens if someone behaves in a manner that is unfaithful, mm -hmm. that breaks and violates the covenant? Yeah. Are there consequences? The problem that you can run into, and this is where Barclay is going, is that you can talk about grace so comprehensively that it gives someone the feeling that they have a pass in all of their expectations. It's like in your youth group, you said you're doing youth ministry, you might say, God loves you, incredible. No matter what you do with your life, God loves you. We can't. And the kid sits out there and he says, wow, that's cool to know. I'm going back to selling weed. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, well, wait a minute, that wasn't the idea. So in other words, it is... It is, it is a love which is generously given, and yet, if exploited, that can lead to consequences. So, therefore, you might say that the benefits of that love, the benefits of having that generous love, come to you only when you live in faithfulness. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, so Israel could have said, well, okay, God loves us. He's given us the Holy Land. We can live how we want. No, they lost the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the exile happened to them. So Barclay is trying to really very carefully nuance this to say, talk about generosity, but also make sure you don't produce a very unhealthy mm -hmm. relationship between God and his people, because there is a necessary response. It's just like when we get married, I get married. My wife says, you know, I love you unconditionally, no matter what you do, I'm always going to be there for you. I love you, I love you, I love you. And then I decide to go out and be in a serial, I don't know, affairs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, and I am unfaithful to my marriage. Are there going to be consequences with that? Yeah, yeah on one level, my wife would say, I've always loved you, but on the other hand, maybe you have broken the relationship or damaged it in a pretty significant way. Mm -hmm. So Barclay is trying to say there's generosity with expectation. Mm -hmm. Good, good, good. Um, well, I'm going to skip over because we, we just kind of talked a lot about the covenant. I would love to at least end with a question about the spirit. Um, and then maybe yeah. if we have time to do a little eschatology. So uh, yeah, yeah. So, so what is the measurable evidence that someone has the spirit of Christ. Um, I think Paul gives this to us in 1 Corinthians 12, 1. He just says, you cannot say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't <clears throat> simply mean uttering those words. It means you acknowledging <clears throat> and having appropriated this idea that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life. That is an otherworldly existence. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the power, the power of, of, of your ability to step out of common life and step into uncommon life in which your life is profoundly connected to God, mm -hmm. that is a divine work. Gotcha. The Holy Spirit empowers that. Um, <clears throat> Nicholas, I think we make a mistake when we begin to catalog many of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, say in 1 Corinthians 12 or Ephesians 4, and we say, well, okay, you have to demonstrate you've got the Holy Spirit by showing one of these gifts. I think total mistake. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Paul is simply trying to talk to a church at Corinth that has um, an, oh, and sort of an obsession with gifts of the Holy Spirit, and he's mm -hmm. trying to organize their thinking rightly. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so therefore, Paul gives that to us in 1 Corinthians 12. But the place, the one place in the New Testament that is the greatest concentration of references to the Holy Spirit is in Romans 8. Yeah. Now, why is that? You ask me, 
how is it that I know? What is the miracle that demonstrates the power of God, the Holy Spirit? The power of God is actually settled in my life and is, and is present in doing his work. For the Apostle Paul, it is the moral and spiritual transformation of the individual. Mm-hmm. That's what it is. In other words, the greatest miracle isn't that you can speak in tongues. The greatest miracle is that someone who is so profoundly broken and we all are in our humanity. Those who are profoundly broken begin to demonstrate tangible evidence of transformation and healing, or what Paul calls in Galatians, the fruit of the spirit. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Nicholas, let me give you an illustration. Here at Calvin, one of the coolest things we do is that there is a state of Michigan a prison that's about 30 minutes away from us. And Calvin started a a ministry there, which now has turned into a whole educational program. It's incredibly cool. We have our own building in the prison. We have a school, a library. You can get an associate's degree in prison from us. Our faculty go in there. It's awesome. I'm one of the faculty. (laughs) I teach New Testament to prisoners. I have 20 men in front of me. I was nervous at first. I thought, wow, this is going to be really weird. I've never been in prison. I don't know about prison. (laughs) So anyway, I'm with these 20 guys. And Nicholas, the reason I go back every summer to teach in prison is not really because I want to explain the Messiah all over again to a new audience. (laughs) I've done that too many times. You know why I go back, Nicholas? Is because these men are selected carefully from the prison population and they are men who have been transformed by Christ. Mm -hmm. And I, you you can't appreciate um, Christian transformation until you're talking with a guy who has a life sentence for murder. And, And when you're with them, you think, gosh, the power of God is so present in prison. It is so evident. You look around Miami and there are a lot of churches and it's all diffused, but you sit in front of 20 lifers and you hear their stories and you hear how these 20 guys are all pastors in the prison. Get that. They're pastors. These are not new Christians. They've been Christians for a long time. You think to yourself, this is what Paul's talking about. Mm -hmm. The most powerful act of God is taking our brokenness and restoring it, reconstituting our lives into what God imagined from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Now, what comes from that is the fruit of the Spirit, and God gives us gifts to do remarkable things. I get all of that. Yeah. But it's John chapter 3, what Nicodemus needs to learn. You've got to be reborn. There's got to be a, a reconstituting of your humanity. There's got to be a, a dynamic connection to God. And when that dynamic connection happens, things start changing. Mm-hmm. Now, that notion of real permanent transformative change is hoped for in the Old Testament and is dreamed for in the prophets, Jeremiah and Ezekiel especially, mm-hmm. but it's <clears throat> realized in the New Testament. Mm-hmm. Good, good. I, I love the passion with which you speak about these things. I mean, I almost feel bad about like having to to stop and you know move forward. Uh, but so to, right. yeah, to just touch on some of the things you said. So the primary evidence is going to be the declaration that Jesus is Lord, and we don't mean merely professing that, but actually having a a wholehearted yeah. allegiance. You might say. Yeah, it's it's that is a sentence that a demon cannot say. Gotcha. That is a sentence that a pagan person who is outside of the presence of God will, is not going to say. Mm-hmm. It isn't just saying those syllables. Mm-hmm. It is a proclamation of, it's a confession yeah. that Jesus is Kyrios. He is my Lord. Yeah. That's the idea. Yeah. And one of the primary places we see Paul kind of unpack what the spirit is at work and doing is in Romans 8. is, is where we yeah. see, you know, the the putting on the mind of Christ, putting your mind on the things of the spirit and putting to death the deeds of the body because of the spirit who's at work in us. Right, exactly. Awesome. We often look for the glamorous gifts of the Holy Spirit to demonstrate perhaps that we've got the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Uh, No, no. 
in, any single day, give me a transformed person mm -hmm. over someone who can demonstrate these fantastical gifts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> give me a transformed person. Yeah. And, and I'll say to you, God has been at work here. Yeah. Yeah, that's a beautiful uh, portion of the doctrine. One of the things that I love to teach about, I mean, I know you kind of made the comment of, you know, teaching students, you know, that God loves them. Um, and, and which we, we do that, you know, we do a lot of time. But uh, one of the yeah. things that we really hit on, and I, I, I think I've tried to really do uh, embody the spirit of Paul, but also like the spirit of John Wesley in my preaching, that is if the spirit is at work in your body, then you should be yeah. producing the fruit of righteousness in your life. Um, and that's something as we as Christians should love to do. Like we should have a genuine love to serve within the family, but also outside in our communities. Yeah, well, look, at Nicholas, think about it this way. I mean, I'm not going to ask you if you have a girlfriend. I'm going to stay away from that. I have a wife. Yeah. So. Oh, you have married. All right, awesome. <laughs> married with a son. <laughs> this is his room. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look at it like this. Is that when, if somebody is, when you enter into that relationship, are you changed by it? That's a really interesting question. Are you changed by it? Is your conduct different? Are your affections different? Are you changed by the relationship? Yeah. And I think that's what we're describing here. Yep. It would not make sense to me, or it wouldn't make sense to you, to marry your wife and be an unchanged person mm -hmm. and to live your life as if you were single and 16. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? No, that would be a contradiction in terms, I hope. Yeah. Yeah, no, my wife took me from being a single 16-year-old to being a father today. That's so. right. Right. So you are a living example of grace. She is the living example of the spirit. <laughs> I'm not giving no, up. That's right. Okay. So it's relationship that bears fruit in transformation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, so we're going to do an outro for the YouTube video. Mm -hmm. Me and you will still be on Zoom. Uh, but Dr. Birch, for those who want to just find out more about what you're doing, where's the best place for people to keep up with your work? Yeah, I do keep a website up. Uh, so it is garyburge.org. And uh, 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 everything I publish is kind of listed there. It's I get a lot of requests for speaking and things. And so it's a go-to place yeah. pretty much for that. So garyburge.org. Um, and then, um, uh, of course, I have a professional website at Calvin Seminary. Mm -hmm. So actually just typing in my, my first and last name, it's seems to just show up in Google. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good, good, good. Well, I do yeah. want to encourage you guys to find Dr. Burge online uh, to get uh, the New Testament in seven senses, sentences. It's not a, a hard read um, and it's it's not expensive at all. And it is a very useful book. And if you guys listen to this, you know, that's what we go for. We want to talk about things that are useful uh, within the church um, and that are biblical. And so <clears throat> this is definitely one of those things. Uh, so yeah, I want to encourage you guys to subscribe. Also, uh, next Monday, we will be back with Dr. Brian Shelton from Asbury University, and he's going to be speaking about the quest for the historical apostles, and we'll probably be doing a book giveaway on that book. Um, I'll be speaking with him about that. But uh, yeah, so I look forward to seeing you guys again next Monday. Uh, so Dr. Burge, remember, we'll still be on. This is an outro for the YouTube video, okay? All right, you guys have a blessed day.